Well, this evening, let's open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. And I'd like to start by reading two verses, verses 16 and 17. So John, chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. And so I'm going to read these verses. I'm going to ask that you follow along with me as I read them, and then we'll pray. And then I'd like to share with you a message that I've entitled, The Holy Spirit and us, the Holy Spirit and us. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Let's pray. Father, again, we just want to thank you for being our Father. We thank you so much for sending to us a Savior, your Son, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit and filling our lives with his presence and and lord it's such a a joy to be able to see the displays of his power working in and through each and every one of us that are believers followers of king jesus and we thank you for the bible we thank you for the word of god and lord we want to humble ourselves and ask that your spirit will guide us in truth and lord that he'll enable us to apply the things that we learn today And I pray that this evening that we would make much of Jesus. And Lord, that we would leave this place more in love with Jesus. And so be honored and glorified in our time together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the words that we just read here in John 14, verses 16 and 17, I think that most of us were familiar with these words. And you guys know that these words are a part of what we call the Upper Room Discourse. Now, the Upper Room Discourse is the teachings of Jesus that are recorded in John chapters 13 and 14. So here's the scene. In John 13 and 14, Jesus is in an upper room in Jerusalem during the observance of the Passover, right? And on this same night... Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to stand trial before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was like the the Jewish Supreme Court of the day. And ultimately, he's going to be condemned to death. But before his arrest, before his trials, before his beatings, before his crucifixion, we find Jesus spending time with his closest friends, his disciples. And here in this upper room, Jesus teaches these guys the things that they needed to know to continue as his followers in the world. Now, have you ever sat bedside next to someone that you deeply care about and love as they're about to die? I remember sitting bedside with my dad back in 2011 as he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And as the cancer was destroying him from the inside out, my mom and I, I'm an only child, my mom and I sat next to him there at Fountain Valley Regional Hospital as he was admitted because his lungs were shutting down. And I remember that moment, I'll never forget it, as the three of us just sat there and we just talked. And my dad began to share stuff knowing that his time of transitioning from this temporary life to his eternal home was really hours away. Now, when you know that you're about to die, or you're sitting next with someone that they know they're about to die, those conversations are meaningful, right? 
Because usually at those moments, you want to talk about those things that matter. Now, I'm so thankful that when I talked with my dad, he talked a whole lot about Jesus. Because for my dad, Jesus is what mattered. Now, Jesus is here with his closest friends, and he knows what is in front of him. He knows that he is going to leave his disciples. He knows that he's going to be crucified. These are the conversations that Jesus has with his disciples before his death. Now, you would think, when you've got time like this, what are the things Jesus would talk about? Well, he talked about loving one another. He talked about prayer. And I think this might surprise a lot of people, but one of these things that Jesus talked about that was really important to him and he wanted his disciples to know and understand was about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked to his disciples about the Holy Spirit because this is information that every Christian should know. This is information that is essential for healthy Christian living. And because Jesus saw that this was important enough to talk about, that's what I want us to do this evening. In the time that we have together this evening, I want us to think about the Holy Spirit. I want us to talk about the Holy Spirit this evening. And really, there are two parts to this message. First, I want us to learn who the Holy Spirit is. It's amazing how there are lots of people in different churches who do not know who the Holy Spirit is. For some, the Holy Spirit is some cosmic force. For others, the Holy Spirit is this emanation that's beaming from God. For some, he's the forgotten member of the Trinity, right? Like he's the weird uncle that shows up at those family reunions and everybody's trying to like forget that he's part of the family. And a lot of times people, they they think about the Holy Spirit that way. It's like they don't want to talk about him. They, They just want to ignore him. Or, for other people, the Holy Spirit seems to be the only member of the Trinity. You go to some churches and it seems like that's all they talk about is the Holy Spirit. But listen, God wants us to know the truth about the Holy Spirit and he wants us to know him in a personal way. So we're going to talk about who the Holy Spirit is. But also, secondly, I want us to learn what the Holy Spirit does. What the Holy Spirit does, especially in the life of a Christian. And again, the reason why this is so important is because there's so much confusion about the work of the Holy Spirit among lots of different Christians today due to either this hypersensationalism about the Spirit or this undervaluing of the worth of the Spirit. And guys, the results are either this fear and aversion of the Holy Spirit or this heightened emotionalism and this charismania. Or there's even some people, they're just completely impassive and disinterested in their attitude toward the subject altogether. They just don't want to talk about it. But listen, to discover the truth about who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does, we need to open up the Bible. We need to open up the Bible and read what God tells us about the Holy Spirit. And this is what I hope to do this evening. So here we go. Number one, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, look at verse 16 and 17 again. Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Now, we know from the context that Jesus here is talking about the Holy Spirit. In these verses, Jesus spoke of him as another helper, the spirit of truth. And then later in verse 26, Jesus calls the spirit of truth the Holy Spirit. So I want to introduce you to the Holy Spirit. And the first thing that we need to understand about him is that he is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, when we say that the Holy Spirit is a person, we're not talking about a human being with a human body. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is a personal spirit with personality. The Holy Spirit is a personal spirit with personality. This means that he possesses intelligence. 
He possesses a will. He possesses emotions. These are the things that define the Holy Spirit as a person. In fact, in verses 16 and 17, when Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit, he uses the personal pronouns he and him and whom. Listen, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is is a who, and I've I've, I've heard lots of Christians refer to the Holy Spirit as it, but that's poor, that's wrong theology. The Holy Spirit is a a who, the Holy Spirit is not a something, the Holy Spirit is a someone. And listen, that has practical application for all of us. R.A. Torrey, born in 1856, went to heaven in 1928. He was a part of Dwight Moody's um, team, and, and he was the Bible teacher on Moody's team. And, and Ari Torrey, he wrote a book called The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit, and speaking about the, the practical application of knowing that the Holy Spirit is a person, he said this, and I thought this was so good that I just want to read it to you. He said, quote, if we think of the Holy Spirit as so many do as merely a power or influence, our constant thought will be, How can I get more of the Holy Spirit? But if we think of him in the biblical way as a divine person, our thought will rather be, how can the Holy Spirit have more of me? Isn't that good? As long as we think of the Holy Spirit as an it or a something, we're going to be talking about him like something that we can stuff in our pocket. How much of the Holy Spirit can I get? But if we really understand that the Holy Spirit is a someone, that he is the divine person, then listen, the right response to him should be, Lord, how much more of me can you get? That is the right question. And people who understand that the Holy Spirit is a person will ask that question. But the second thing we need to know about the Holy Spirit is not only is he a person, but listen, he is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Bible teaches that God is triune, right? We believe that. That God is one in substance and he is three in persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we can say that, but in practice do we believe that? You know, like, we feel comfortable sitting at the front of the bus with God the Father and God the Son. Yeah, the Father, I totally get Him. It's awesome being in relationship with the Father and the Son, yes, totally get Him. But let's keep the Holy Spirit at the back of the bus. He weirds me out. But listen, He's God. God is triune. One in substance, three in persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit, he possesses the attributes of God. He does the works of God. And his words are called the words of God. And when we say that the Holy Spirit is God, this means that we are confessing that the Holy Spirit is eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present, and all-glorious. This is who the Holy Spirit is. And anything less than that, you've got wrong theology. Wrong ideas about the Holy Spirit. Now, going back to R.A. Torrey, He said this, making practical application of knowing him to be God. Now listen to this, quote, it is of the highest importance from the standpoint of worship that we decide whether the Holy Spirit is a divine person worthy to receive our adoration, our faith, our love, and our entire surrender to himself, or whether it is simply an influence emanating from God or a power or an illumination that God imparts to us. Now listen to this, here's here's where he drives it home. If the Holy Spirit is a person and a divine person, that he's God, and we do not know him as such, 
then we are robbing a divine being of the worship and the faith and the love and the surrender to himself, which are his due. Wow. I wonder how many of us have been robbing God, the Holy Spirit, of all the worship and all the obedience that he's worthy of. I mean, think about that. Have you ever thought about robbing God of worship and devotion and obedience that rightfully belongs to Him? I get it. Like, for most of us, God the Father, yes. God the Father, I worship you. And God the Son, yes, I get that. I worship you. But what about God the Holy Spirit? He's God, He is the third person of the Trinity. And this is why this topic is so important because I know for me personally, I don't want to rob God the Holy Spirit of the worship and the obedience that he is worthy of. So what do we know about the Holy Spirit? Well, he's a person. He's God. And here in John 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus calls him another helper and the spirit of truth. Another helper. Now, in telling his disciples of his departure... to the cross, and then after that, he would go back to heaven. Jesus, knowing that his disciples were beginning to feel a bit uneasy with this, you guys got to remember, I mean, these guys had been with Jesus for over three years. They walked with him. They ate with him. They spent time with him 24-7, and now Jesus is saying, I'm leaving. They were feeling uneasy, and so Jesus knowing how they were feeling. In fact, he could see it on their faces, all the anxiety. Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit would come to them, and in coming to them, by coming to them, Jesus said in verse 18 of John 14, I will not leave you orphans. I'm sending you another helper. And that that phrase, another helper, speaking about the Holy Spirit, it means a helper of equal quality. This word helper The Greek word that's translated helper, it speaks of one who comes alongside and provides help and comfort. And Jesus is saying the same help and comfort, the same quality of help and comfort that you receive from me, you know what? When God the Holy Spirit comes, he is going to bring the same kind of help and comfort to you. And that was comforting. And we see how the Holy Spirit did that for these guys, right? In the book of Acts. But not only does Jesus call him another helper, but he refers to him as the spirit of truth. And I love this because this is the title of the Holy Spirit. He is someone who always speaks the truth. And he is someone who always acts according to the truth. There is no falsehood in him. He is incapable of lying. He is incapable of deceiving. And that means that he shows us what is true and what is false. He shows us what is right and what is wrong, especially in an age of moral and philosophical relativism when everyone is saying, well, there's no absolute truth. It's just really subjective. It's however you feel about truth. No, God says there is a standard for truth and it's absolute. And God, the Holy Spirit, has made truth known to us. He revealed it to us in this thing called the Bible. These are the inspired words of God that were brought to us by the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit moved people to write down in language that you and I can understand God's truth. And so, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, He's a person. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is our helper, and the Holy Spirit is God. That means He's worthy of all our praise and worthy of all of our obedience. Well, number two, What does the Holy Spirit do? Well, again, looking at verses 16 and 17, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. Now listen, 
for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, there's a couple of statements here I want you to focus in on. First, in verse 16, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, he will abide with us forever. How long? Forever. I like that. And then in verse 17, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Listen, these words describe the Christian's relationship with God the Holy Spirit. And these words are awesome. They describe the relationship that you have with God the Holy Spirit, the relationship that God the Holy Spirit has with you. The Holy Spirit is with us and within us. That is what he tells us in verse 17. He dwells with you and will be in you. Now listen, this is a special and unique relationship between God, the Holy Spirit, and us. And this is what distinguishes us from non-Christian people. Jesus said in verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Listen, what makes the difference between you and a non-Christian is not that you go to church. You know there are non-Christians that go to church? It's not that you read the Bible. Do you know that there are non-Christians who read the Bible? It's not that you like Christian music. There are non-Christians who like Christian music. What sets us apart from non-believers, people that are not Christians, is this thing that the Holy Spirit dwells with us and within us. This is a special relationship that exists only between a Christian and God. And so we see the Holy Spirit remains with us. He says that in verse 16, that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, he dwells with you. And I think these words are so powerful, so precious, because these words highlight the closeness and the communion of the Holy Spirit with us. You know, in the Greek, the words translated abide and dwells, they're the same word. It means to live and to remain. And again, the Greek word that's translated with, that preposition, it means union, companionship, and fellowship. Right now, as we're seated in this sanctuary, the Holy Spirit is with us, but it's important that we understand He's not with us in the same way that a parole officer is with a parolee. But he is with us. And I want you to hear this because this is so important. He's with us because Romans 15.30 tells us that he loves us. When was the last time you thought about that? That God, the Holy Spirit, loves you. Again, God the Father loving me, we get that. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We get that. And so we're drinking in of the Father's love. And God the Son, Jesus Christ loving us, we get that. He suffered and died on the cross and he drank in full measure the cup of God's wrath on our behalf. And, And as Paul says, who loved us and gave himself for us, we get that. But when was the last time he thought, I am loved by God the Holy Spirit. And yet he is the one person in the Trinity who is the most ignored. Listen, whether you realize it or not, whether you recognize it or not, whether you acknowledge the Holy Spirit or not, as you're sitting in this room, there is a whole lot of love that God the Holy Spirit is dumping out on you and me right now. You and I are the object of love of the Spirit. And and we should say, thank you, Father, for loving me. And thank you, Jesus, for loving me. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for loving me. Wow. And because He loves you and because He loves me, He is constantly, always, forever with us. But also the reason why he's with us is because he brought us into fellowship with him. That's what 2 Corinthians 13, 14 teaches us. Think about that. 
The Holy Spirit wants to be our friend. We get so weirded out by the Spirit that we're like running from Him when the Holy Spirit just wants to be our friend. And He wants you to be His friend. And He wants to have that kind of intimate, personal relationship with you. Think about it. What a powerful testimony that you can tell people that you are a friend of God. And the fact that He is with us forever, that's pretty cool. And that means that we are never alone. And some of you, you need to be reminded of that tonight. Whatever's going on in your life right now, whatever baggage you walked into this place with, you are feeling very alone. It's easy when you are a face among a sea of faces to feel like you are the one person in church that God has no clue exists, but that's not true. God the Holy Spirit is so committed to you. His love for you is so relentless and so courageous and so fearless. You gotta know right now that you are loved by Him, you are known by Him, and you are never alone. But not only is He with us, but He resides within us. He resides within us. In verse 17, He says, He will be in you. Now, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of us the moment we started trusting in the Lord Jesus as our one and only Savior. And again, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is the mark that we are real Christians. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, the Bible tells us those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. So again, it's not that you come to church or, or you read the Bible or you like Christian merchandise and you got a Christian bumper sticker or fish on the car. Listen, what makes you a Christian is that God the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. If he doesn't live inside of you, you can, you can like be into church and, and all that stuff all you want. You're not going to heaven. And the way we have the indwelling presence of the Spirit within us is when we trust in Jesus as our one and only Savior. But listen, the Holy Spirit didn't come inside of us just to take up space. But he's inside of us doing stuff. The Bible teaches us that the indwelling spirit, he sealed us, he assures us, he leads us, he empowers us, and he transforms us. Let's talk about this. First, the Holy Spirit sealed us. If you're taking notes, jot down Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul wrote, in him, that's Jesus, you also trusted, that's faith, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that's evangelism, in whom also, Jesus, having believed, faith. Now listen, when you gave your heart to Jesus, this is what happened. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who was the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now remember, Paul wrote those words to a group of Christians in Ephesus. And that language meant something to that audience. Asia was known as the marketplace of the Roman world. It was the place where East met West, and they would go to sell, they would go to buy. It was a happening place if you wanted to buy stuff. Now imagine if you lived in Rome, and you thought, you know what? That one room, it's missing something. I know, it, it needs this one piece of furniture. And so you decide you're gonna take a trip down to modern day Turkey, there to the city of Ephesus to go furniture shopping. And as you're looking into one shop after another, there it is, that one chair. That one chair will make that room. And so you you agree on a price with the store owner, you shake hands on it, you pay the money, and the transaction has been made. He gives you the receipt. 
The thing is, though, that chair is too big for you to carry back with you to Rome. So you make an agreement with the shopkeeper. Will you package this chair and will you send it to me in Rome? And so what they would do is they would package up the chair, but then they would take a seal and they would stamp it with your stamp. That identifies that this chair was purchased by you and it belongs to you and the shop owner guarantees that it will get to you. And so he loads it up on the docks there and then it's shipped and it lands on the, at the port of Pudioli. Messages sent to you. So you go to the docks and then you look for that crate with your seal on it because it's identified. You purchased it. You be- it, it belongs to you. And the person who, who you did the transaction with, he came through on his promise in making sure that that piece of furniture got to you. That's what Paul is talking about. When God the Holy Spirit sealed us, it speaks of two things practically. First, authenticity. The presence of the Holy Spirit means that we belong to Jesus. Jesus is the one who purchased us with his own blood, which I think is another sermon in and of itself, especially when Christians are always saying, well, you know what, this is my life. I want to live my life my way. I don't care about what Jesus thinks I should be doing. You know what? I am going to live my life my way. And all Jesus has to do is say, show me the receipt. It's your life, your way. Show me the receipt. Because guess who holds the receipt to our lives? Jesus does. And that's a reminder, as Paul said, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. So the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are authentically a property of King Jesus, but also it's a word of assurance. The Holy Spirit guarantees that every person who is a Christian will get to heaven. Because you understand that Christianity is the only religion in the world that can say that. Talk to a Muslim. Do you know you're going to get to heaven? I sure hope so. Talk to a Catholic. Do you know if you're going to get to heaven? I sure hope so. Talk to a Christian. Do you know you're going to get to heaven? I know that I know that I know so. Guys, the reason why we are this certain about us going to heaven is because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. But not only does the Holy Spirit seal us, but he assures us that we are the children of God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16, Paul says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. So jot that down, Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We were born into the family of God supernaturally, but the moment we were born again, the Holy Spirit then legally adopted us into the family, giving us adult standing. And the reason why He did this is so that you and I can start enjoying the riches of our inheritance now. We don't have to wait till heaven to start enjoying the benefits of being a Christian. We can start enjoying it now. But one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is He bears witness with our human spirit that God is our dad and we are His kids. And so we can call Him Abba, Father. And you guys have heard it that Abba means Daddy. You know, when you go to Israel, you can still see kids doing that. I remember when I was in Israel, I saw this little maybe four, five-year-old boy and running to his dad saying, Abba, Abba, Abba. And I'm thinking, man, that is so precious. That's so sweet. And God is saying, you can talk to God like that. But this assurance, this Holy Spirit assurance that We know that when we give our hearts to Jesus Christ by faith, we believe that we're God's children, that we belong to Him. But there is this this 
measure of assurance that God brings to us at different points in our lives when we just need to know that we need to, that, that we need to know that we know that we know that God's our dad and we're his kids. Now I want you to think about this illustration and I know that for some of you this illustration might be difficult to, to hear because some of you, you grew up in a home where either dad wasn't there or you just had a rotten dad. And right now, you're on a journey where God is really trying to change and transform and purify the way you think about dads. But listen, we should never judge God on the basis of what your dad was like, but we should judge all human dads on the basis of the standard of our Father in heaven. God is the perfect dad. And whether your dad was a good dad or a bad dad, listen, right now you have the perfect dad. Now I want you to think about this illustration so I can try to illustrate this point of what it means that the Holy Spirit gives to us this assurance that we're God's kids. Try to imagine a father and a child. Try to imagine you as being the child. That you're walking along the beach with dad. And you know, you know that he's your dad and you're his child. There's no doubt in your mind. You're holding hands with him and you know that he loves you and you love him. That's settled. But then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, your dad then picks you up in his arms and he holds you tight and he twirls you around and he starts flooding your faces with kisses and then he squeezes you tight again and then he sets you down and then holds your hand and then you keep on walking. Now you knew that he's your dad and you're his child, but the extra measure that that. The dad showed you at that moment, like you knew that you were his child, but now you know that you know that you know he's your dad and you're his child. That's what Paul is talking about. For every believer, there is a moment where God the Holy Spirit just comes upon your life and it's like he just picks you up unexpectedly and he squeezes you tight and he floods you with kisses and you Know that you belong to God. For some of you, that might have happened during worship. Man, I've been in times where worship, it's just like I'm, it's like God just opened up the tap and, and he just began to just flood, just torrents of his love all over me to the point that I just feel crushed by his love. Like I know that I belong to Jesus. I know God's my dad and I know he's his child. But at those moments, the Holy Spirit is just giving me this extra measure of assurance that I belong to him and he belongs to me. Now that doesn't mean that we won't doubt as Christians. I've struggled with doubt. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was around six years old, I'm 45 years old, and there's still been times where I started even wondering, am I really saved? Am I really going to heaven? I mean, we have our times of doubt, but then I remember those times where the Lord just, His Spirit just came, and He just, this extra measure of assurance. Listen, if the Holy Spirit has never borne witness with your spirit that you are a child of God, then you need to start taking inventory. And and as Peter said, to make sure that your calling and election is sure. Because for every child that belongs to the Lord, at one point or another, the Holy Spirit brings to you that measure of assurance that you belong to him and he belongs to you. The third thing is the Holy Spirit leads us in God's will. Write down this reference, Romans 8.14. Romans 8.14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You know, one of the characteristics of someone born of the Spirit is that he he and she are being led by the Spirit because we know that the Spirit wants to lead us and we want to follow. He wants to lead us in worship. He wants to lead us in holiness. He wants to lead us in service. He wants to lead us in relationships. He wants to lead us in life. And he wants to lead us in God's will. I think that there are way too many Christians that are stressing out about what God's will is for your life. 
And the reason why is because you are stressing over the place. Is it that place or that place? Is it that person or that person? Is it that activity or that activity? Listen, God doesn't want us to stress out about the place. He wants us to follow Him in the process. Remaining in the will of God is not about you figuring out the place. It's about you remaining in step with the Spirit in the process. If you follow what, if you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit today, you'll get to the place. If you walk in step with the Spirit on a daily basis, you'll end up with the right person. If you walk in step with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, you'll end up doing the right things. God wants us to enjoy Him every day. And He'll lead us. We just need to be sensitive in following His lead. But not only that, the Holy Spirit also empowers us to overcome sin and practice holiness. That's what He does for believers. Jot down Romans 8.2. Romans 8, 2 says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I want you to see what the New Testament is teaching us about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has set us free from the law, the law of sin and death. You guys want to know what a law is, right? I mean, these are absolutes. The law of sin says Everyone must sin because everyone is a sinner in bondage to sin, right? It's a law. And the law of death says everyone must die because they are sinners deserving eternal punishment. It's a law. These are absolutes. And yet, here in Romans 8, 2, Paul writes about the law of the Spirit. And we see that this is the new, the greater law that has replaced the law of sin and death. Let me illustrate it this way. There is a law called the law of gravity, right? We all, we all obey this law every day. If I was to climb up to the top of this building, no matter how much wishful thinking I apply of not falling, the moment I step off the ledge, I'm going down because the law of gravity is saying you must come down, right? It's a law. But last weekend, I boarded a plane at LAX to fly out to Vancouver in Canada to go speak at a conference. And as that plane went down that runway and there was lift, that plane got up in the air and for two and a half hours, it stayed up in the air. You know what the law of gravity was doing at that moment? It was screaming at that plane saying, you must come down. It's the law of gravity. It's a law. But how was it that that plane could say, you know what? I'm not gonna have, I don't have to obey the law of gravity right now for two and a half hours, and I'm so thankful it did it. <laughs> but for two and a half hours, that plane said, I am not gonna obey the law of gravity. How could that plane do that? It's because a greater law replaced the law of gravity called the law of aerodynamics. Guys, in the spiritual realm, the law of sin says, you must sin. But the law of the Spirit says, in Christ, I don't have to. So when we're tempted to sin, and your flesh is saying, you owe me this, give into it. The law of the Spirit says, you know what, you're free. Jesus set you free from the bondage of sin. You can choose to say no to sin. I mean, think about that. Every time Christians give in to sin, it's because of choice. You can choose to either say yes or no. When you say yes, you're living like what you used to be, a slave to sin. When you say no to sin, you're saying, you know what? I'm alive in Jesus, and I'm free, and you do not have control over me anymore. 
You're free. The law of death says you must die. The law of the Spirit says in Christ you will live forever. Now, this fact doesn't mean that we're no longer going to fight and struggle against sin because this battle is going to go on until we get to heaven. But what it does mean is that we can be victorious over sin if we choose to be. Paul put it this way in Romans 8, verses 12 and 13. Dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. And guys, we know that the key to living victorious over sin is by walking in the Spirit, right? Galatians 5.16, I say walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The idea there is it's impossible to be walking in the Spirit and giving into sin at the same time. I know that some of you guys are struggling with stuff, and it's a battle. No one is diminishing that point. But you need to remember who you are in Jesus. You can say no to the law of sin and death. It is your birthright. Being born again, it is your spiritual birthright. And you just need to cultivate that part of your life where you gain a little bit of ground every day to the point that you're now no longer crawling in the battle, but now you're sprinting victoriously through the battle. You can be free. You can be victorious because Jesus died for you and Jesus rose again from the dead and he conquered the grave and he, and he rendered sin powerless over his people. One last thing and we're done. The Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, he sealed us, he assures us, he leads us, he empowers us, and he is transforming us. He's conforming us into the image of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, write that reference down. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is God's ultimate plan for our life. Everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, that is happening in our life, God is working everything out for good. And that ultimate good is so that in the end, when we get to heaven, every single one of us are going to look just like Jesus. This is a promise that God made, and God keeps every one of his promises. And listen, God is wise enough and he is loving enough that he will use every and any circumstance in life in order to accomplish his mission. There, for example, is no such thing as wasted suffering. Some of you might be thinking, why am I suffering like this? And everything about your suffering feels like a waste. But do you understand that in God's economy, there is no such thing as wasted suffering? You might be thinking, why am I having problem in my relationships? But guys, those are opportunities that God uses in order to accomplish his mission. He will take the good, the bad, the ugly in order to do something that, that we all need and we all desire, even though we don't recognize it. Remember when the psalmist said, and I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Too often, we complain because we don't get or we don't have what we think we deserve or what we should have in this temporary sphere called the vapor length life. But listen, God is more interested in your long-term good than he is in your momentary happiness. We're like kids. I mean, you that are parents, it's like, you know like how kids are ready to like do whatever they can just for momentary happiness, but you know that, man, the long run, in the long run, 
You're going to lose out. It's just like my little girl. Like, I love my little girl so much, and, and she saved $25. And she goes, hey, Dad, I got $25. I, I'd like to go to 7-Eleven and buy this toy thing, this plastic toy thing. And I'm thinking, oh, like a 75-cent toy. He's like, no, it's $10. $10 at 7-Eleven? And I said, there's no way I'm going to let you spend $10 on some plastic thing that you're going to play with and you're going to break in like less than 24 hours. And the whole time, I said, like, well, you don't love me. <laughs> oh, if I just had this thing that just spins around on my finger, my life would just be so complete. You don't love me. And I'm thinking, listen, I can think of a whole lot of better things that can happen with that $25 that you have in your piggy bank. But think about how childish we get, right? Lord, if you just give me this, just give me that plastic toy, I'll be so happy, I'll never ask for anything else. And the Lord says, are you kidding me? No, you can't have that. Oh Lord, you don't love me. I'm done with church, man. This is so lame. I thought if I became a Christian, everything was going to go my way. And we go with a huff and a puff, and God's looking at you like, are you kidding me? I've got like eternal, like, like exceedingly abundant wealth waiting for you. And, and you want trinkets? Come on. And so the Holy Spirit, he's shaping us, even now in this place. As you're listening to this message, God the Holy Spirit is making you more like Jesus. When you leave this place, he's going to make you more like Jesus. For you that are going to stand in that, or, or drive and, and stay and wait in that line to go through in and out, which is a line worth waiting for. <laughs> right? I mean, it's almost like, it's not like if you close your eyes, it's like, I could smell heaven. <laughs> but even in the process of waiting there, God is going to make you like Jesus or getting stuck in traffic. Guys, if we can just start embracing that there are no wasted opportunities in God's economy. Because as long as the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, we know that he'll take every advantage to complete his mission. And how long did Jesus say the Holy Spirit will remain with us? Forever. So that means 24-7, he's working all things, all things together for our good, which is ultimately to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Now, how does that change the way you think about stuff that happens every day? Listen, all these things that we learned this evening about the person and work of the Holy Spirit, he is this for you. And we're just scratching the surface here. But man, if there's anything that I want for all of us here tonight, is for us to be reminded again of how loved we are by the Spirit and how worthy He is and how encouraged we should be that whether you realized it or not, God the Holy Spirit is doing some pretty amazing things in and through your life. Aren't you blessed and thankful to be a child of God tonight? Let's have the worship team come on up. And let's just, we, as we just close out, let's just respond in just loving on the Lord for who He is. Not just two out of the three persons of the Trinity, but all three persons of the one Godhead, the one true and living God. And let's just remember tonight that we are his kids and he is our dad. So Lord, thank you so much for every person who came this evening to hear this message. And, and I pray, Lord, that you'll take this truth and just anchor them in our hearts so that we would just love you and worship you and obey you in a way that you are worthy of. Thank you for saving us, Lord. And you know, if there's anyone here that maybe you've been invited to come to this place or maybe you've been coming here for a while but you've never really given your heart to Jesus, we want to give you an opportunity to know Christ. Or maybe you've been 
playing church, but you've never had that experience where the Holy Spirit bore witness with your spirit that you're the child of God, and you're thinking, gosh, maybe I, man, maybe there is more to this Christianity thing than just going to church and singing songs and wearing Christian t-shirts. Maybe it really is a relationship. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something. Rather than leading you in a prayer to repeat, you know, what I like to share with people that don't know the Lord is I said, listen, if you're stuck in a burning building, no one needs to teach you how to cry out for help because you recognize your desperate situation, right? So I'm going to give you a minute. In your own words, in your own way, just talk to Jesus just quietly, and just tell him how sorry you are for your sinful rebellion against him, and, and just affirm that you believe that Jesus, who is God, he died on the cross and rose again from the dead, and in your own words, just tell him, Jesus, will you take my heart? Will you take my life? If you need Jesus, just in these next 60 seconds, in your own words, talk to Jesus right now. And the rest of you, you be praying for people that might be praying that right now. Guys, this is the most important decision you can make. Give your heart to Jesus. Just pray. Pray to Jesus. Father, for anyone, for everyone who just asked Jesus to be their King, their Savior, we thank you that you have now filled them with your Spirit and you've sealed them with your Spirit and they can say they know that they know that they know that they're going to heaven. And Lord, we pray for not only for them but for all of us that you will help us to be so aware and so sensitive to the presence of the Holy Spirit that in our everyday life that we would follow Him, that we would yield to His leadership. And Lord, that in following Him, that He would always lead us, that we would follow Him as He leads us into the glorification of Christ. Let it show up in how we open our mouth and worship you. Let it show up in how we extend our hands to serve your people in the exercising of gifts. Let it show up in the fruit of the Spirit, the character of Christ. As you're making us more like Jesus, I pray that people would just see more of Jesus in each one of us. We just want to love Jesus by the Spirit. So be honored and glorified in our lives personally and within us collectively in this church. As we close out with this final song, if, if you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, will you please come and connect with one of the, the men that's up front here at the stage and just say, hey, you know what? I just gave my heart to Jesus. Some of you, it, it might be the first time you ever heard prayed something like that. For others of you, you've prayed it before, but you just realize, man, I've been playing games. And it was more of a rededication than anything. And for others of you, if you just have any specific needs, maybe you just need healing or just a word of encouragement or just you just want someone to pray over you, these men are here to pray for you. But let the Lord just magnify Christ among us. Amen? Let's worship.